All right, I'd like to welcome everybody back to Alabama Care. Today we're in Birmingham, Alabama at the Lakeshore Foundation, and we have Mrs. Wendy Lujano, Director of Aquatics at the Lakeshore Foundation, and Miss Emily Mallard, Aquatics Coordinator at the Lakeshore Foundation. And today we're gonna to be talking about all things water and swimming. At this point, I'd like to hand it back over. Mrs. Lujano, if you would introduce yourself. Sure. I'm, as you said, Wendy Lujano, the Director of Aquatics here at Lakeshore Foundation. I've been the director here for about 12 years. And um, by profession, I'm also a licensed massage therapist. So it um, enables me to enhance a little bit of my work in the water, uh, which is not normally talked about or even heard of. Yeah, you, uh, and I imagine that gives you kind of a leg up, um, knowing how uh, the muscles uh, need to be tended for um, in the pool and stretching and, right. and making sure everybody's safe there. Mm -hmm. Now, we always like to ask, are you originally from Alabama? I am. I'm, I'm an, a Birmingham native, uh, born actually in Huntsville, but only spent three months there. Um, but yes, been here all my life. And is it Roll Tide or War Eagle? It's Roll Tide. Okay. <laughs> Very you, cool. You have to pick a side, I know. <laughs> I feel like, and I say this sometimes, but I crossed the uh, state line about five years ago, and that was one of the first questions is, what's yeah. your team? Uh, yeah. So you got to pick a side pretty quick. Yeah. Quick, yeah. yes. <laughs> and, and they have to know on Iron Bowl. Yeah. Um, Miss Mallard, uh, you've been a guest on the Alabama Care Show before. Uh, mm -hmm. I'd like to do another introduction. Sure. So um, my name is Emily Mallard. I'm the aquatics coordinator at Lakeshore. And um, I have been at Lakeshore about 13 years, started um, as a lifeguard doing swim lessons and kind of worked my way up once I graduated college. So anything that is water related, you're going to see one of us, Wendy or myself. <laughs> um, so you really started with Lakeshore while you were in college. Mm -hmm, I did. Yeah. And did that start off as like an internship or volunteer work? Um, I went to Sanford. So literally right next door and through one of my, I have an exercise science degree and through one of my classes, we had to do some health assessments. So I came um, in the building, always had a swim, I had a swim background, um, did a lot of water stuff growing up and I just said, I wanna work here. So I went downstairs, asked about lifeguarding and here we are. <laughs> a lot of times it's making that first step. Um, I remember in college or in high school trying to get your first internship or job, but being, mm -hmm. being willing to take that first step yep. and ask, yep. is there any way that I can help or is there an opening here? Yep. Um, so that's amazing. And I, as soon as you walk in the door here, it's very arms wide open, mm -hmm. uh, welcome. Right. Uh, so I can imagine yeah. wanting to be a part of that at a young age. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So we're going to talk a, a decent about a, a decent amount about the pool um, and water, and I'd like to kind of give it a general summary. Um, why are the benefits of aquatics uh, for persons with a disability or the aging population? Why are they so beneficial? There's a lot of factors that go into play that people don't really um, understand or they know they feel different, but there is a science behind it. Um, the, the primary uh, science is hydrostatic pressure. When you immerse your body into a decreased gravity state, it automatically encourages the cardiovascular system. It is stimulating, it's stimulating the muscle structure, um, things that hold us up, creating that stability. And then moving through kind of a viscosity um, that is not mimicked on land. So when people, they think of a pool as being, well, I'm not really getting a good exercise until they go to get out. And when they go to get out of the water, they realize, oh, what has just happened? <laughs> because I'm so heavy, I cannot lift my arms and legs. And maybe that's spending about 30 to 45 minutes in the pool, but they don't realize what is happening physiologically to their body once they enter into the water. And then that um, a light bulb kind of goes off and they say, well, gosh, I could do so much more. I couldn't walk around the track one lap, but I spent you know, 30 minutes walking in the water. What is the difference? And so you know, our specialist here are all educated to explain that and kind of put it into a layman's term that they can understand. And, and then, you know, the rest is history. They're a lifelong pool goer. 
Yeah, it sounds like um, you go in thinking, I'm just going to be walking around the pool for a little bit. It's not that big a deal. Uh, maybe I'll try this out. And then you get out of the pool and you're like, that was a decent workout. I am tired right now. And you kind of get hooked at that. Yeah. It's like. Yeah. I think a lot of people go into it thinking it's swimming. They have to swim. Mm -hmm. And it's so much more than that. I mean, we even have people that will come in and just hang in the deep end or sit um, on the bench and just ha have the benefits of the water um, with little movement. And you were kind of saying that as soon as you get in the water, uh, it increases your cardiovascular system there. Mm -hmm. How does that work? So it goes back to the hydrostatic pressure. The pressure that is on the body, you know, the PSI, essentially of the water is just squeezing the body so it's like you're going into a fitted um like a wetsuit yeah you know, like a wetsuit is really kind of what's going and then when you move in that uh, whether it be forward backward sideways it's just contributing more of a resistance on the body and um, it is amazing people people who can't move on land can move in the water and so they're they're just you know it's like again that light bulb and and seeing their expression and knowing oh my gosh i feel great now on the back side of that it it does exhaust them quickly and we try and limit their usage of the pool to say hey be aware you don't know how your body's going to respond and they'll come back a couple of days later and said, whew, that really got me. You know, I had to, I had to take a break for a couple of days. And, um, but it also brings a good marriage to the things that we offer in the fitness center and other areas of our building. It just complements it very well. It's the same for the respiratory system too. You know, there's a added pressure on your chest and your lungs, and so you are forced to take a deeper breath than you are on land, you really don't even realize it, but you're strengthening your lungs just being submerged in the water as well. The way we're talking about it, it makes me think of compression socks. Sure. Mm -hmm. um, but a exactly. compression sock for anything that's in the water mm -hmm. increases the blood flow, flow for anybody uh, that might have been in the hospital or might be a little bit older. Um, you've heard of compression socks and wearing them on your mm -hmm. ankles and lower legs uh, to increase the blood flow there. So right. we can think of it as by getting in the pool is kind of putting on a compression sock. In a fun way. In a fun way, <laughs> yes. And increasing that blood flow around the body right. uh, and getting that heart pumping, which is good to get every day. Right. Um, but I do agree, you know, I can, I play hockey, I can play hockey, I can lift some weights. I can probably do like five laps in a pool and I'm done. And so people wonder why. Mm -hmm. I think I'm in good shape. <laughs> I feel like I could, why can I, why am I out of breath when I go? And swimming is the only exercise where you're using everything you have. So exercise on land, you're limiting. Yes, you're using your lungs and your heart and your but it's putting it that compression around your body that you don't get with air so it, it just is different and they're like okay i understand and not to play into you know the the density of your muscle tissue that that that's way a, above my head <laughs> that, 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 that's a i don't have any it. questions planned for that I know. that puts a factor in it too but um again it's it's just it's, it's a real science behind it um, as you mentioned, some people, I think a lot of people after the swim, they go, I have to take a little bit of a break or maybe a nap. And I notice after I get out of the pool, like two days later, I'm going, why am I hurting in this area? I didn't know this existed. Right. And there's like some little muscle that I never use that only gets used in the pool. Right. Uh, yep. and it acts up on me in a few days. Right. Um, and it sounds like you ever see those masks that people will wear while they're lifting or working out to reduce their oxygen mm -hmm. and kind of take it to a different mm -hmm. level. Uh, it's kind of like that with swimming that no matter what sport you're doing, get in the pool, it's going to take you to a different level. Mm -hmm. It does. Yeah. And I love how you're saying that even though you might not be able to walk a lap around uh, the track, mm -hmm. you can still get in the pool and have just as good of workout, if not better. Yeah. Um, so it sounds like kind of a starting place, even if you're younger and you've mm -hmm. never worked mm -hmm. out. It's a, it's a workout that you're probably not gonna get hurt doing, 
Right. Uh, you're not going to pull a muscle lifting heavy weight. Um, and even if you're a little bit older or, or have some type of limitations physically, it's a, it's a great place to start if you're thinking about getting into working out. And an, another misconception about the pool is people say, well, you know, I like the free weights that I get in the fitness center and I really want to build muscle. Well, anything that floats in the pool, once you submerge it underwater, it becomes a weight. Mm -hmm. And that's just a kind of a a thought process that we're not used to. Yeah. I want to put a weight in the water. Well, that's not a good thing. <laughs> we want to go with styrofoam. I think they float. say the water is seven times thicker than air. Mm -hmm. So pushing through that resistance, you are weight training. Without any equipment. Right. Yeah, yeah, so if you're just walking, it's like yeah. you're having weights behind you mm -hmm. right. uh, if you were on the track there. Now, do you know, or, or do you um, kind of see that if somebody's new to Lakeshore and wanting to get into exercise, that um, you kind of guide them to swimming first? Or is it more, here's your tour, you can decide what to do? Well, in our orientation process, we show them all things. And it's a bit overwhelming because we also say, well, you know, come back in a couple of weeks because there's a lot of things to do here. Yeah, this place is huge. Right? Um, but I think for the pool, what shows up a lot is, do I have to wear a swimsuit? Um, putting, maybe I haven't exercised in many years and putting myself into a swimsuit. So there's a body image issue. There's also a fear of the water if they're not a swimmer or, um, as Emily said earlier, feeling like they have to, you know, swim the length of the pool to be successful. Um, so we say there's t-shirts and shorts you can wear, there's active wear that you can wear in the pool, um, and then also understanding you don't have to know how to swim. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's a good thing about Lakeshore is that we work with everybody. Our motto down in the pool is if you have a will, we have a way. There's a way to do it, and, and the entrance to the pool is amazing. It's a gradual descent, mm -hmm. uh, so you don't have to jump in, um, and there are multiple ways to get in and out of the pool there. Um, and I'll ask about those, but I do want to comment on some of the fears you were talking about. Mm -hmm. Now, my aunt, uh, I've been here for about five years and helping take care of my aunt in various ways, and when she was younger, she used to love to be in the pool. And then for whatever reason, uh, I want to say it was about 12 years ago, as soon as she would get close to the pool, she would start to wig out a little bit, didn't really like it. And we didn't know what happened. Maybe it was that she, uh, someone wasn't right with her when she was in the bathtub and she went under the water for a little bit or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that could be a fear for a lot of people is what happens if, you know, I go into the water and I'm not confident that I myself can come back up. Mm -hmm. um, but you guys have lifeguards on duty kind of at every corner there, uh, making sure that the pool is well taken care of. We do, and part of our orientation process for a new member is we'll meet with them one-on-one -on -one and talk them through how to get in and out. If they're not swimmers, the section of the pool that is best for them. And we'll, you know, we'll make sure that they're comfortable before we just let them go on their own. Um, so we're kind of talking about it now, so let's go to that question. What are the ways to get in and out of the pool here at Lakeshore? So the, you mentioned the zero entry mm -hmm. is like a, a beach. You can gradually walk in. And we have two pools here at Lakeshore. We have a therapy pool, which is um, warmer. And then we have uh, what's considered a lap pool, or uh, we call it our cool pool. Uh, it's 10 degrees cooler than what our therapy pool is. Both of them have a zero entry. And then the unique piece about our pools is that the sides of our pools angle in towards the water. Most of your commercial pools will angle the side away from the water. So a person who, who has a physical disability, it's very difficult for them to exit out of the, the water, um, whether they be a chair user or have limited mobility. Here at Lakeshore, that the water will lap over the edges of our of all of our pools. So that's a way to exit. We also have grab bars if they have dexterity hand um, function. Then we also have water wheelchairs if they need assistance and want to transfer out of their current wheelchair or limited mobility in their legs. Um, or if they're an amputee, I mean, there's all kinds of ways. And then we have manual lifts at both pools mm -hmm. um, that allows for that. Um, if they are a um, athlete and are a chair user, 
the center of both of our, between both of our poles is a, what we call a, a wheelchair ramp. And it allows an individual to wheel down towards the edge of either pool and they can transfer directly into the pool from their chair and then exit the same way. Mm. Um, so there's really multiple way as well as the common steps and ladders. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like the design that uh, you guys did in, in that, uh, I'm sure you brought in a lot of people to talk about that design, but it's very well thought out. Um, and my aunt uses the, uh, what's the, the- The water wheelchair? The slope, the gradual oh, slope. The zero there. entry. Zero entry. She uses that and she transfers from her uh, wheelchair to one of the pool wheelchairs mm -hmm, that yes. is kind of like a PVC piping mm -hmm. uh, structure. It's very sturdy, but it's water resistant or, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. can go in the water there. Um, and then at the point that she's able, where she's deep enough in the water and some of that buoyancy kicks in, then she'll get up by herself mm -hmm, there. Mm -hmm. Why would, why would, what would be the case to use the manual lift as opposed to a water wheelchair like that? A lot of it has to do with um, personal preference, body mechanics of, you know, the, the water wheelchair can provide a, in some cases a little bit more support. Um, whereas, you know, or on the opposite side, the lift has kind of a narrower base with closer armrests so it you know it, they're just very different and um, you know we talk through all that during that orientation and figure out kind of what's best so personal preference really mm -hmm. is whatever you're most comfortable right with. and but if in the event that the lift were to be occupied or not working we can always get someone out with the water wheelchair that's kind of our um, universal we have several sizes of those. And I would say for anybody that's uh, maybe a little <laughs> bit hesitant or some of those other things that you talked about, um, you know, maybe wearing the swimsuit or getting in and out of the pool, that kind of stuff. Everybody that's already in the pool, when my aunt comes, there's already people there. Maybe they're doing a class or just hanging out on the step, like you said. Everyone's very welcoming. Uh, there are times when my aunt wants to sit down and we'll just go right over to the step and people will be like, hey, how are you doing today? Uh, you know, come and have a seat, let's talk. Uh, so don't be uh, nervous about meeting people here. Uh, it's very family oriented is what I feel. Absolutely. And it's, it's very forgiving. It, it, there's not judgment here. Like where most people, if they went to a, a local recreational center, their um, their stairs, their, you know, people look and often curious, but don't ask the questions. Here, you're among a familiar and it creates such a great community and um, social um, experience for so many people who are maybe housebound or not have a lot of um, social connections. I mean, the social benefits are just as much as the physical. Yeah. You know, if someone doesn't come, their group's gonna check on them. They're yeah, gonna right. call and find out where they are. Or and they come to us and say, yep. hey, have you say, have, maybe I've just missed their time. A lot of people rely on public transportation to get them here. Mm -hmm. And so the, the bus may not have ran that day or, uh, but it's just, it's quite, um, it's a it's a neat thing to see kind of unfold how um, people come into the social compete. I used to teach the Parkinson's class several years ago, and we started at two o'clock. At about one fifteen, they would all be crowded around the bench, just waiting, talking to each other. And that you know that's great. That's not something that that we could have um, put out there. I mean, they did that on their own, and I think that's that's a huge piece of this too. Yeah, uh, and I feel like um, maybe some people come through the front door and have bad experiences in other facilities, and they kind of have a sigh of relief here, like. This feels, this feels good. Uh, and you start to build those social connections there. Uh, that's amazing. Um, I wanna talk about some of the programs, specific programs that we have going on, <clears throat> that you guys have going on here at Lakeshore. Um, we have, in, and this is for adults uh, primarily, um, we have individual exercise classes. If you could tell us what those are. So along the orientation process, if an individual comes in and they say, well, I really want to work with shoulder range of motion. I, I, my shoulders are freezing up or I have arthritis or whatever the pathology that they're dealing with, then the specialist can gear an individualized exercise program with them. And the, the specialist will work with them for a little bit and kind of get them going. Um, 
if they're self-motivated. If they're not, then we would look at our um, programming for adults. We offer 43 classes a week. 43 uh, for classes. adults only. That is a lot of <laughs> <Yeah>. classes. <laughs> so we will fit them in to something that can facilitate what it is their, their goal or if they don't even have a goal. We usually, some of the conversation starts with, um, you know, well, what is something you would like to achieve in, in your household? Are you having trouble, you know, getting a cup out of the cupboard or... Um, you know, we'll, we can have some leading questions that will develop some things that they want for themselves to achieve and, and then just kind of direct them into um, a class that will facilitate that if they want, you know, a group. So they can do the individual uh, classes and that's more of a one-on-one -on -one with a specialist. Now, mm -hmm. does that cost extra? It does after a certain time frame, but you know, with the orientation process, we try and get people on going on a, a good wellness path. And if they want to continue to work with a specialist one on one, then yes, it is a, a small fee. Um, being nonprofit, we are definitely under the, the trade cost of that. Um, and that could be thought of kind of as a personal um, trainer. Sure. Mm -hmm. in, in a way there. Mm -hmm. So uh, starting off, we can do individual exercises if you have something that uh, you really want to focus on, and then you can go and do that uh, independently um, once you've been trained and have that program down. Um, but for those that may not be able to do that on their own or don't have that drive, <clears throat> you kind of direct them more to the group exercises. Uh, and if you could talk a little bit about the group exercises. Same kind of thing. We, we look at what they're um, wanting to achieve or if they come with a pathology for instance if they have a neurological condition that um, examples Emily stated earlier Parkinson's or multiple sclerosis then we're going to gear them to some of those neuro classes neuro focused classes um, if they're dealing with arthritis then our range of motion classes um, if they're 60 plus and we know at a certain point we all just have aches and pains. Um, at 35, that, yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we'll gear them to um, something that's good for, for pain. Um, it's nice having two multifunction pools mm. and the difference in temperature because we can, we can really encapsulate so many people um, and, and what they're wanting to, to offer. No, and go ahead, I'm sorry. The, the classes really give a wide variety of exercises, equipment, the instructors are, are changing. So, you know, I know when I go work out somewhere, I get kind of bored doing it on my own. So if you do a class, then that just exposes you to things that you may not have done before or new pieces of equipment that we have um, and gives you kind of a more ideas to kind of translate some of that on your own as well. Uh, and that brings up the, uh, like you get those muscles that you're tweaking you know, mm -hmm. with different exercises mm -hmm. you didn't know exist. Uh, so you kind of One of our fun classes that developed out of a, a neuro class was the Parkinson's class. We, um, as Emily stated, the group of men <clears throat> was primarily men. We did have some females that were there, but we noticed that they had a competitive edge. Oh, yeah. So anytime, anytime we were um, working with equipment or challenging them to race type things, the competitive edge just outshined everything. And so the instructor at the time said, what about volleyball? And we play it with a beach ball. That has turned into one of the most popular classes and it has included a lot more than just those individuals with Parkinson's. But what we kept seeing were the strides of posture changes. Mm -hmm. And these men would be coming in with walkers and you know, bent over in that classic Parkinson's um, posture, but having to reach for a ball in the water, and they're just under chest deep um, water, and then having to reach, they, they put aside their walkers, they were standing upright, they were amazed, they were telling their doctors, and so that's been a 
fun. <laughs> and their reaction but, times? And their reaction times got better. Um, we had to change the time of the class because we did a, a survey and found out that we needed to have it just a little bit um, later based on medication. But, you know, that's the, the beauty of Lakeshore is that we, we try to adapt to what our population needs. Mm -hmm. And um, that's been a, a fun class to to now be able to start back up after the Yes, so we, we even had to move that class to the cooler water because they were working out so hard. We had to give the them like, you're not allowed to spike the ball anymore. And you know, if, if we, we lay down some rules, if, if we are not over there right at their time, they have that set up and they are ready to go. <laughs> Um, but that's really uh, awesome, and I love how the competition brings out a little bit of maybe the extra 10%. Mm -hmm. um, it reminds me when you're saying that uh, there's sometimes when I'm tired on the ice, mm -hmm. but if the puck is in front of me, I don't think about knees. All I think about is scoring that scoring, puck. Right. Yeah. Right, yeah. Uh, we so, told them they're not allowed to keep score anymore, though. <sighs> yeah. We, well, but, that, well, because it, a lot of, um, like I said, it's a popular class, and um, you have strong wills there and we we just had to okay guys we just need to have fun here yeah. we can't get into a competition they start like breaking into teams like i'm, I'm drafting her today <laughs> well we've had to rotate the teams around yeah, and mix you know things but up. it's great <laughs> that's awesome uh, we have a special guest with us today uh mr bob lujano uh mr lujano would you like to come on and uh mr lujano is going to tell us about an upcoming event here um, actually, I have your mic set up there in the end. Thank you. If you want to change that camera angle around a little bit. Thanks for coming today, man. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you. It's good to see you again. Uh, I was just telling Mrs. Lujano that uh, I think the, the first time we met was at uh, Is Able uh, with Mr. Yes. Brown. With Lorenzo, yeah. Yeah, and you were speaking to the, the life skills class there. Yes, I did. Remember? Yes. So, uh, that's awesome. Thank um, you. We'll just wait for uh, Clifton to give us the go ahead here. Um, okay, Mr. Uh, Vizi mentioned that there's an upcoming event, I believe, August twelfth. Yes, correct? it's the uh, celebration of champions event. And um, I, can I stop you for just sure. one second, Ms. Lujano? If you would introduce yourself. Sure, I'm Bob Lujano. <laughs> Uh, inclusion Specialist uh, at the National Center of Health, Physical Activity and Disability, located here at Lakeshore Foundation. And are you originally from Alabama? Actually, no. I was originally uh, born in Wichita, Kansas. Wichita, Kansas. Grew up in Texas. But I've lived here for the last 20 years. And we always like to ask, is it Roll Tide or War Eagle? <laughs> Actually, it's Go Vols, because I'm a volunteer. I graduated University of Tennessee. Uh, along with Peyton Manning and a lot of other Tennessee athletes. So. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure you, you get a little bit of hate uh, for that down here. <laughs> Very cool. And um, about how long have you been with uh, Nick Pad and Lakeshore here? Together, uh, I'll be 23 years come November 1. So uh, moved here in 98 and thought I'd be here for just a couple of years, uh, get some work experience, but uh, 20 plus years later. And uh, it's been a great experience. and. Uh, being able to work with Lakeshore and Nick Pad, and you know, even married my wife as well. So those have been been great opportunities and great experience being here. Yeah, and I'm sure you've seen uh, Lakeshore kind of go through the renovations. I mean, the the additions that have been put on in the last few years, and and kind of grow with Lakeshore. Then uh, definitely, yeah, we started off with one gym, one pool, one fitness center, and and yeah, I was a recreation program for Lakeshore uh, programmer, uh, working with youth and kids and uh also very much played the sport of wheelchair rugby for the last 20 years murder ball for anyone yeah. that's unfamiliar <laughs> murder ball for anyone's unfamiliar and uh very much uh, has seen it grow and it's great to be a part of that and and including just expanding program wise uh when i got here it was only just a few sports and now it's really expanded even just the actual organization heading into the world of advocacy and policy and research so it's it's outstanding to see all that just uh be a part of that. Yeah, and, and also I hear about the collaborations that you guys are doing with UAB um, and so the, some of the other bigger institutions in town for, um, you know, to work and collab is really cool there. Now, uh, kind of the hot topic right now, I watch it pretty much every day, uh, are the Olympics and then it's going to be coming up the Paralympics. Um, so uh, I understand that there are a number of Paralympians uh, that have come through Lakeshore here. Um, yeah, definitely. Uh, 
since 98, uh, there's always been someone from Lakeshore, affiliated with Lakeshore, that's been part of the Paralympic Games. Uh, I was fortunate enough to be on the 2004 team, which went to Athens, Greece, and uh, we won the bronze medal in the sport of wheelchair rugby. Um, we took about, uh, I believe, 12 athletes from Lakeshore that trained here uh, to be part of that 300-team uh, U.S. squad, in which Jeff Underwood was the chef de mission. Uh, so again, it was a great experience, great opportunity. It was my one and only, and I'm very thankful that I did medal because it would have been very frustrating <laughs> to not have medaled after so much work. It's, it's literally the hardest thing I've ever had to do was be a part of that Paralympic team, and especially in the sport of wheelchair rugby where there's over 500 athletes, men and women, compete in our sport, and to be one, selected one person on a team of 12, uh, they just didn't give it to me because I was good looking. <laughs> I very much had to work real hard for it, and and appreciate that effort. So. Um, and speak, if you could speak a little bit about that process, um, the training for the team, was that, were you working up for years? Uh, or what did that look like? If somebody was interested in, in joining and trying to get on an Olympic team, what would you kind of say to them? Well, in regards to Paralympics, yeah, it was very, uh, for rugby, it was very much uh, uh, an arduous process, no doubt. Uh, like you said, about 500 athletes, men and women, play wheelchair rugby. So you have to get invited to try out camps and they select a, a national team of about 20 to 25 athletes and that'll start the four years of kind of whittling down and you know it, it, sometimes it may even be that you're the best athlete it may just be what you are classification wise i know in our 2004 team we didn't have any class 3.5s that tried out and we had some outstanding 0.5s now we couldn't take a 0.5 because we didn't have a 3.5 it kind of defeated the process so one of the better players as a, as a 0.5 couldn't go because we didn't have really a spot for them so it really is about the makeup of your team from a classification standpoint uh, it's not always uh your your best 12 it's your 12 best um and, and that's all based on classification as well so you know at the end of the day it, it's a very arduous process for anyone interested, you definitely need to get in touch with, um, you know, the, the USOPC because there they have different types of sports contacts that you can reach out to, whether it be swimming, track and field, and there's different national championships that typically happen in which you would need to make sure you're part of that. But uh, that would be my first suggestion is to contact USOPC. And of course, you're, if you're here in Birmingham, Alabama, you know, you just need to come to Lakeshore Foundation. and be a part of our wonderful swim teams. And, and a lot of it starts at a, a youth level. Um, I'm, I'm sure Emily and Wendy have talked about the success of our, our junior athletes, especially the swim component of it. So uh, definitely look, look for those opportunities in your local area. But I'd first reach out to USOPC um, just to see what contacts you could establish in, in your part of the country. Um, thank you for giving that background there. And I'm unfamiliar, um, a, you mentioned a 3.5 and a 0.5. I, I'm yes. unfamiliar with that, if you could explain that. Sure, uh, a lot of classification is built on your functional ability and with the sport of wheelchair rugby, uh, the athletes that have the lowest function will get, be giving a lower class number, which is 0.5 is the lowest number you can have. In the sport of wheelchair rugby, usually athletes that don't have good finger function or balance uh, we'll get class lower, you know, if they have paralysis in their biceps and triceps, they're at a lower class, and you just take it from there on up. Uh, the more function you have, you'll eventually go up to a 3.5, which is an athlete that has very good function in their hands and, and uh, as well as balance. Um, myself, I was as a class two, uh, not having hands, but having very good balance. That's what put me in the area of class two and not having very good, uh, not having any paralysis in my bicep and tricep. So it's all based really on uh, being classified by a physical therapist to kind of uh, determine what muscle function you have. And, and I'm sure it is for all sports as well. Yeah. Um, and then you mentioned uh, really putting the team together there. <clears throat> and that reminded me, I don't know if you've ever, ever seen the movie Miracle on Ice about the 1980s uh, ice hockey team and how he had a bunch of uh, college kids. And he was able to have you know some some different people on it, and he got these really young kids that had never played together before, and they really came together and ended up winning there. Um, but when you're you're going through that process, it, it made me think of 
you know, creating that team that's going to be able to win, not necessarily the individual players. Yeah, we always say it's a, it's about the the name on the front of the jersey, not on the back of the jersey. Yeah. So once you're able to see that and realize that's what you're playing for, then hopefully you can check your ego at the door and look to be a part of a team. Yeah. Awesome. Um, and one of the questions that I was going to ask here is, um, you know, if you're swimming in the pool, you might uh, bump up and be around people that are Paralympians. Um, and I'd like you to kind of highlight some of the things that might be going on on the 12th. Definitely. Uh, well, it's our Celebration of Champions event on uh, Thursday, August the 12th at noon. And it's a one hour virtual event celebrating the Olympic and Paralympic spirit, if you will. And it's really just about uh, just knowing some of the athletes. Uh, you'll get to virtually, you know, interact with them, uh, ask questions, and you know, whatever events are going on. Uh, it's really about promotion and celebration uh, of the Paralympics, of the Paralympic athletes, and their achievements and their their goals. And, and really, just about the, the the four, actually five years of, of hard work uh, that we've had to put in as, as athletes. At, so really, that's really what the celebration is about, is just recognizing the incredible accomplishments uh, of our teams, of our athletes, especially our U.S. wheelchair rugby team, which this is the home of the U.S. wheelchair rugby. And, and you know, for five years, many of these athletes have been coming to recognize their goals, to, you know, to fulfill a goal. And, you know, five years is a long time. And, and many of these athletes have taken five years out of their life. Uh, I know myself, I had to miss you know, family gatherings, family reunions, birthdays, celebrations, graduations, you know, all those are put aside for this one moment. And so really, it, we would like everyone to come be a part of it, uh, to ask questions, to meet the athletes, to, to kind of get a little bit of understanding of who they are and, and uh, really just what this means to them uh, and what it means to all of us at, at Lakeshore Foundation uh, in our city and state of Birmingham, Alabama, and, and of course in our country. Um, you mentioned some of those sacrifices that these individuals have made and you've made. Uh, I'm sure having that medal uh, at home uh, is worth it. Very few people ever, ever get to have that. Um, and, uh, you know, do you have it on display? I have to ask. Yeah, I would I, have it on the wall. <laughs> I would too. Yeah. yeah, I do. I have it in my display case. And, um, you know, at the end of the day, it's, 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 you know, you really don't focus on the medal. The medal is just the cherry on top of the sundae. It's really... Like I said, the, the, the four years, or in this case, the athletes, five years of just, you know, missing that event and having to prepare and, you know, oh, I can't go out tonight. You know, this is my time to work out for the next two hours. You know, there, there's just such a high expectation. And, you know, I recently read, uh, just to digress a little bit, with uh, that Simone Biles had to pull out of I did hear that this morning. Yes, yeah. and, and, and really she cited more than anything just the mental stress of it, of being the greatest athlete and now you need to deliver again and you know, that's a that's a lot of pressure and and you know no doubt it's great to have these high expectations and these athletes have that but there is a cost and it, it's it's personal sacrifice and maybe mental stress as well that you have to uh, endure but you know at the end of the day you know it very much is something that uh, the journey to getting there is what you remember the friendships uh, the people you encounter the you know, the people that are helping you get through those tough times, through, through those mental stress times. Uh, it could be, you know, your very own family, your spouses, uh, people that are close to you. Uh, you know, those are the things that uh, that you think about uh, when you're on the stand and, and going through that cherry on top of the Sunday moment of getting the medal. So it really just makes you reflect on all of that, the, the, the people, the sacrifice, the commitment, uh, the, the group of athletes that you're forever tied with. So uh, that's what really what the medal represents, and, and really it's a reflection of the journey getting there. Um, it's kind of that blood, sweat, and tears going through the trenches with that team, uh, exactly. lifelong relationships there. And um, on the 12th, are the uh, athletes that are going to be um, kind of on the, the broadcast there, are they uh, for the upcoming Paralympics or are they past Paralympics? No, these are the Paralympians that will be going. As a matter of fact, our U.S. wheelchair rugby team will be here for one more final training session before they head off to uh, to Tokyo. As a matter of fact, I believe they're leaving from here straight to Tokyo. So, uh, you know, this is the last time that you'll get a chance to meet them. Uh, you know, if you go to lakeshore.org, you know, you can get your free tickets now. So, again, this is just an event of celebrating, a celebration of champions, just uh, promoting the, uh, you know, Paralympics and really the celebration of our 
Paralympic athletes that have made that commitment. Yeah, and I feel like it would be really cool to kind of ask a question. Are there going to be live questions during the event? Yes. To be able to ask a question and then have one of the Paralympians answer and then watch them on TV in in two weeks. Like, I was just talking with that person. Exactly. They eat Wheaties too. (laughs) (laughs) Um, And uh, this is going to be a virtual event. Exactly. Um, And uh, kind of uh, through like a Zoom link so you can register. Uh, Tickets are free. Yes. Um, now, uh, you do have an opportunity to um, donate, though, if you, f- if you feel like that's something you want to do. And, so, and that donation directly goes to the Paralympians and, and the uh, program. Is that correct? Exactly. What we've set up is uh, what we call captain's tables to where uh, if you go again to the website, lakeshore.org and Celebration of Champions uh, link, just click on that. And it'll show you there's about 12 different captains uh, of, of these tables. And, you know, maybe there's someone you want to uh, partner with, uh, you know, a captain that you know of. Uh, I know Jeff Underwood, our CEO, is one of the uh, captains, uh, table captain. Um, so feel free to find the person uh, that you want to you know, as- uh, align yourself with and click on their link, and you can definitely make a, a donation. And, yes, it all goes back to, to Lakeshore and, and celebrating and promoting uh, the Paralympic athletes uh, that come here to train especially our U.S. wheelchair rugby team. So, uh, again, definitely need any support we can, uh, you know, and this is actually that opportunity. Yeah. Um, so whether that's, you know, $5 or $100, exactly. um, please please get in on that action. Um, definitely. And uh, help our, uh, our <coughs> ladies and gentlemen bring home the gold. Mm-hmm. Exactly. So, um, if you would give us, uh, I'm unfamiliar with the schedule. When did the Paralympics start? It'll be, uh, I believe, around the 19th of, of August, and then forgive me if I'm not on top of what the date is, but uh, yeah, once once it'll run through, I believe, through the uh, beginning of September, and, and that's when it ends, so it's two weeks there. It usually, when I went, it felt like it was a whole month uh, <laughs> that I was there. Just, you know, sometimes you get there ahead of time to, to get processed and find your village, and a couple of days of training so i you know so you you get there ahead of time just to be prepared uh and i believe it will end on the seventh so um so yeah that's that's definitely uh an experience that you want to very much savor every ounce you can get uh, you're, you're there to, to, to train and practice but you also kind of have to soak in the magnitude of the event and what you're representing and uh, just watching a little bit of the olympics some of the family members are doing zoom parties for their favorite athlete or family member so it's you know you're able to capture a little bit of the, their excitement because uh, it will be a different type of Paralympics but uh, you know at the end of the day it's still the second biggest sporting event in the world and we're very much uh, you know wanting to represent as much as we can and support as much as we can well I know that um, Nick Pat and Lakeshore are huge um, in the Paralympics and representing USA on that uh, international scale so uh, thank you for everything that you guys do and uh, I look forward to tuning in. Mm-hmm. So, um, and is there anything else for the twelfth that you can think of? Oh, just at the end of the day, uh, just realizing that uh, you know Lakeshore provides a great opportunity, uh, not only just for Paralympics, but also just for in adaptive sport and including people with disabilities. And you know, as we move forward to this, you know, twenty-first century and beyond, you know, the objective for all of us is to have an opportunity to be a part of a sport, to be a part of recreation, to be part of opportunity to have a healthy, active life. And, um, you know, Lakeshore provides that opportunity. And, you know, if you look around your own city and state, maybe there are things that you can do uh, to make, you know, your city and state more inclusive to people with disabilities. And if, if needing that, or if wanting that and needing help with that, please feel free to reach out to us at lakeshore.org as well as uh, nickpad.org. So uh, these are opportunities where we can very much educate and promote inclusion in your city and your state and and definitely looking to promote uh, the best of health outcomes for people with disabilities yeah thank you very much for being with us today and, and being our guest uh, uh speaker here oh well, you're welcome i appreciate you guys being here and let's uh you know let's go for the gold no doubt about it heck yeah team usa <laughs> thank you very cool um okay we will uh transition back to uh the swimming here i know that the paralympics is kind of hard to top there we're going to go back into individualized classes <laughs> um, and we'll go ahead and change some of the camera around thanks for coming in man i really appreciate oh, that no, thank you very much gentlemen 
and we'll go ahead and put the um, Celebration of Champions link uh, in the chat so people can click on that from there. Uh, be pretty cool. Um, so we were talking about uh, starting off with a specialist, um, a kind of a personal trainer, and then uh, either going and doing, continuing the training by yourself or getting into the group exercises. Now, there was another program that I saw listed as lap swimming. Mm -hmm. um, is that kind of free form? You come in yeah. when the pool's mm -hmm. open and you, you kind of do laps back and forth? Mm -hmm. I feel like that's a really good exercise, but I've done swim, lap swimming before. I, tr I was training for like a triathlon and you kind of just zone out, which is like where you get the runners high, I guess, kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, you're just by yourself, but it can be monotonous. Uh, and so I, I see how like the group classes could kind of uh, energize you a little bit more and then maybe you go to the, to the lap classes. It can, but with lap swimming too, I mean, we have several people that will come together and they'll share a lane and, and you know, there's a community amongst the lap swimmers too. Now so, they're not like competing for points there, are they like in the volleyball? <laughs> well, I mean, they might be, <laughs> no, no, they're not, but it's been really interesting. You know, when we, we had a period of closure during um, the, during Pandemic. COVID and then when we reopened, lap swimming was our most popular thing for a while, really? and it still is. Uh -huh. So, which I think is great. Um, you know, I think there are a lot of different reasons that that could have been the case, but um, you know, we had six lanes open all day, and they were always full. We had to go to a reservation process for that, and you know, that's kind of it's, yeah, it's never been our strong right. suit. We always used to have three lanes open. Yeah and hardly anybody utilizing them. And um, some of the feedback we got is they're needing a cardio workout in the pool. We didn't have our classes going on at that time just because of the six foot social distancing and mm -hmm. it makes it difficult in, in the pool when everybody's moving. <laughs> I do so. feel more comfortable in the pool. I feel like the chlorine would have some type of damper. It does. On. I don't does. know if that's true or not, but that's just. <laughs> it, does. It, does. it does. It does. Again, the science behind that is that there are chloramines that float 10 to 12 inches off the surface of the water. And the three things that the COVID could not live in is chlorine. One one was chlorine. Yep. So I didn't um, know that. So we were like, okay, well, this is kind of a, you know, um, if you are going to exercise, well, if you are going to exercise, yeah, somewhat of a safe place. Yeah. Uh, until you got out, um, but on the lap swimming, we also create programs. If people, you know, say, "Well, I want to, I want to do this, but I don't know what to do," so we'll we'll make a workout for them. Um, we have them little laminated cards that they can take poolside. We show them some swim equipment that can facilitate what they're trying to accomplish, whether it be fins for their lower limbs or um, webbed gloves, you know, or the paddles or um, leg buoys. I mean, we have all of that. So it's, it's not just showing up and saying, okay, I want to get from point A to point B and, you know, what can I do with that? And if you really are an avid swimmer, they've got swim goggles now that can track your time they have they have smart goggles they have mm -hmm. smart goggles they have i want them um you know the mp3 earplugs that attach to your I goggles some, yeah. that, you know it's there's just all kind of things that enhance um you know the mundane of going back and forth yeah <laughs> one of our, go ahead. i'm sorry one of our classes is called adult adult learn to swim and so that class um, is designed for individuals who don't know how to swim and, and want to learn to swim or lap swimmers that might want just someone to critique their stroke and you know I'm having trouble breathing can you give me some pointers that kind of thing the breathing is difficult when I first started doing that try stuff <clears throat> I didn't know how to keep my head underwater I was doing like the breaststroke <laughs> I'm like I'm not gonna ever compete if I do this so I started watching all these YouTube videos mm -hmm. the breathing was one of the hardest parts for me and getting that down to it was it like is. every third time i think i would come up for air right. uh, but it was it felt really awkward uh, i felt a little claustrophobic mm -hmm. uh to say the least it's kind of like out. an alligator right keeping just your eyes right. out yeah you know, especially if you're in open water you know so we we have all of that expertise you know to give anybody we um our programming starts at six months of age to the end of life uh, our oldest pool user has been 100. Um, that lady would come three times a week and attend uh, the one o'clock class and um, 
made it to her 100th birthday. She actually lived to be 101, but um, it was just amazing to see. And, you know, in this pandemic, when we closed briefly from March to May, how quickly we saw people digress mm. um, that couldn't get into the water and because that was their only place that they could exercise. And it, for us, that's something in our um, profession we haven't been able to really witness in a massive of a group. We've seen it in one individual kind of one-off things, but to see a, you know, a, a group of 10 to 12 people come in and you're like, gosh, when she left or he left, they were not using an assisted device and now they're just really relying on an assisted device. And it's like, well, that's two months, mm -hmm. you know, of, of just taking something that the only place they could exercise away. And it's, so I hope we're not getting back into that anytime soon. Yeah, but, me too. Um, and then I feel like that can kind of be deflating for the individual. Oh, it was. It I know was. if I don't, if I'm not on the ice more than once a week, when I go out there for my league mm -hmm. game, mm -hmm. I'm passing the puck. Yeah. I'm not skating. Yeah. Um, so it can be a little defeating there. And two months is a, a big time to take off, but mm -hmm. hopefully they're coming back in saying, you know what, here I am. <clears throat> this is where I got to get they back are. to. They and are. it gave everyone kind of a new, a renewed appreciation for the pool. Mm -hmm because you know we were all so lucky that we could be in the pool six days a week and then when that was gone for a while it kind of was a light bulb moment of i'm really making progress here mm -hmm. you know i've got a this is a huge huge impact mm -hmm. gotta stay with it and you mentioned that lady that was 101 i mm -hmm. bet she contributes a lot of her long-term success to being active in places like the mm -hmm. pool her mm -hmm. family shared a lot of, of touching uh, remarks. Uh, unfortunately, she did pass away, but um, it was something to hear from from them and to see. And we have a lot of people in their 90s, you know, um, that come every day. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, now you've mentioned that there's a difference in pool temperature. Yeah. Why is that? So, um, as Emily said earlier on. Um, you can't do a lot of cardio exercise in a warmer pool. Um, it increases blood pressure. It can cause um, stress on the heart and the cardiovascular system, creating dizziness. Sometimes people have passed out. <laughs> um, so it, it, we are just very fortunate to have the ability to have two pools. You know, a safe temperature, water temperature for exercise is anywhere from 83 degrees to 93, but you have to, you know, kind of configure what you're doing in that, that realm. Our therapy pool uh, is, our set point is 94, but it can go from 93 to 95. And then our cool pool is 83 to 85. Mm -hmm. Now as a competitive swimmer, competitive swimmers can swim in 77 degrees to 80, is or will some some will say 77 to 82 um, that's the the prime uh, Fahrenheit um, water temperature and air temperature is very different so if you think of you know 77 degrees and air temperature Perfect that seems rock. warm yeah it's cold um, it is freezing cold for, for water yeah. you know um, I'm not the physics to know that the exchange rate but um, it is it one degree our pools can get off one degree and our members know that instantly like, hey, hey. i know hey. <laughs> this is cool and then if the we keep our air temperature around 80 mm -hmm. and then the humidity um, around 59 percent so um we try and try and keep a balance of all things so when you come out of either pool being wet you're n it's not frigid it, yeah you know um, but if that air temperature goes up to 82 our, my staff is just it's like I can't breathe yeah. in here what's going on you know um, it all is again a science behind it and one little thing can create a ripple and, and change it all and and if it's if it's storming outside i mean that affects what's happening inside mm -hmm. um that makes sense when you, you you lay it out that way the therapeutic pool um is a little bit warm um to, so it's good for pain people yeah. that have just that um discomfort of mobility and or maybe have fibromyalgia 
whatever's going on with them, that that warm pool kind of gives them a nice it's like getting soothing in, hug. It's, <laughs> and then on the other end, you wouldn't want to do laps in a hot tub. Right. Um, yeah. And you'll know that there, if you come and see us, there are no lap lanes in our therapy pool. <laughs> and we <laughs> ask the question, I mean, they have the markings on the bottom of the pool. And people say, well, you have the markings. And I say, well, that's just a commercialized set up for all pools. It's, a, it's something that they put in, at, in all of them. And they've got the hooks along the wall. But I said, you won't ever see a lap lane in the, the therapy pool. And we do yeah. the majority of our youth programs in the warm pool as well. And I've even noticed that's for a child who may have fear of the water that is kind of more of an inviting environment it's not the shock of the cold um I, I hate getting into a cold pool yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they say it's good for you to get, wake up and take a cold shower but i'm yeah. not a fan of it yeah. well uh, but some people like you know oftentimes individuals with ms have a heat sensitivity so they need the cold mm -hmm. and so i think that's that's why it's we are so lucky that we have both mm -hmm. Um, now, you had a really great transition there. Uh, so kids <laughs> wanting to get into a little bit warmer pool. If you would tell us about some of the youth programs here at Lakeshore. Sure. So like Wendy said, we start at age six months and go all the way up. Um, so we have a combination of um, there is a younger parent-child class called Wet Tots. And that is our six months to three-year-old class. And oftentimes, kids that age may not have a diagnosis yet. And so there may just be some some delay um, and that's where we kind of step in to work on balance body awareness even just some walking a lot of kids will walk in the water independently first get you know they're able to get rid of all their assistive devices and kind of be more independent it reminds me of my family member mm -hmm. when you, mm -hmm. you say it like yep. that um, and then from there we have swim lessons and um, there's an older child functional class where we work on we use all the different depths of the pool and work on the strength building fine motor skills gross motor skills a lot of balance core strength um, and then we have an advanced swim class and moving into swim team if that's something that kids want to do um, aquatics has been heavily involved in swim team this year i was one of the coaches and we you know they had a great they had a phenomenal season and one of the things that I even noticed with them is just independence overall I mean it wasn't just the stuff in the water you know we went to Atlanta for a meet and one of the girls said I don't think I can get in and out of my chair on my own well at the end of the meet she did the whole time you know you put them in an environment where they have to kind of figure it out a little bit and they and they and they did it kind of They're stretching great. a little bit yeah. um, and, and building that confidence is what mm -hmm. you're seeing there and what mm -hmm. you're saying. And seeing the parents who, not to say that they're all enabling, but step back and go, oh, I, I'm not sure they can do that. And trusting Emily and then the other head coach, Daniel, yeah, they got it. Let them, let them experience it. And it's like, oh, Okay. <laughs> yeah. You know, in both of the meets that we went to recently, the parents had to stay in the bleachers upstairs. Oh, you didn't allow them. <laughs> no, that wasn't well, our that rule. Wasn't it, yeah. That was that was the facility rule. And at first, I even was a little nervous about it. But I think it was great. You know, it forced us and the kids to they. You know, they paid attention. They helped each other. You know, one little girl was like, "Get your cap on, let's go." <laughs> you know, it's time. Um, but that is something that. You, you know, you don't see just during practice. And so that even taught me a lot just about don't underestimate them, you know? Yeah, it's, I feel like sometimes uh, we'll put our limiting beliefs on others. Mm -hmm. um, and if, you, if they get in a situation, an environment where they're able to kind of stretch and see what they can mm -hmm. do, they're gonna surprise you. Mm -hmm. uh, so that, that is, I love to see that. And I've heard that from parents sometimes mm -hmm. where, <clears throat> we're nervous, we're gonna go out to a camp. Uh, I always am around my child. Uh, mm -hmm. And then they see what they do throughout the day and then they come back at nighttime. They, you did what? Right. Yeah. You went out on a boat and you're out on the what? Yeah. You know. Uh, so to kind of step back there, I, I think is really cool. Um, and sports in general allow that to happen. Mm -hmm. um, and I think a lot of these, you know, some of the swimmers, yes, absolutely, the Paralympics is their goal, but some of them it's not. Mm -hmm. It's more about, overall exercise and, and teamwork. And I think that's great too. I think there's a place for that. There's a, you know, it's given me a new understanding of, 
you know, the athletics piece and also the recreation piece and how both of those are equally important. Mm -hmm. Both of those have their own set of benefits and, um, kind you know, a, it's a life lesson. Right. It's really great them. to to be able to see all that. Um, I, re I forget where I read it, but it said, um, you know, your job as a parent, uh, and I'm not a parent, but your job as a parent is to make sure that your son or daughter is socially acceptable by the time they're 11, uh, to learn those lessons. And then it went on and saying sports uh, allow that person to win and lose gracefully and learn how to to be a functioning member of society. Um, and I, I was involved in sports growing up. I highly recommend getting involved and it doesn't have to be very competitive. Uh, it can be leisure uh, activities, but in a group like that. And, and you know, Bob touched on the classifications for rugby, the, the swimmers are classified as well. Mm -hmm. So it is a team sport, but it is very individualized as well. So, you know, they're not gonna be swimming against kids with much higher function than them. I mean, they're they're swimming against kids with their ability, and that is, you know, comforting to them to know that it's going to be fair. You know, that's one of the things they said. They're like, "Is it going to be fair? Am I going to have to swim against? You know, I can't use my legs. Am I swimming against someone that can?" Mm -hmm. And so, showing all of that, and how you know, we went to Denver for our recent nationals meet, and for them to see kids that were like them, you know was great yeah Denver's and then did, to win and then to win <laughs> well you didn't even you weren't going to tell us that. <laughs> I know, I know. <laughs> she's being a little humble <laughs> she's being pretty modest right now well, well, if you, <laughs> you don't want to see the national <laughs> champs you better come here to Lakeshore well, so um in June we went to Atlanta for the Peachtree Pear Games and ended up winning that meet and then um so all of the summer athletic for swimming is under an organization called Move United and so they um, put on all the meets and last week we were at uh, the junior nationals so that is the nationals competition for anyone under the age of I believe it goes to 22 um, and for swimming they were given medals for first second and third for each event and each classification and i will brag and the lakeshore yes. kids got yes. they medaled in everything wow. we got 16 gold eight silver and three bronze that's amazing. So, and you know, and no disqualifications. And no disqualifications. Disqual DQs and swimming are pretty frequent. Really? So. Is it that, like you start too soon? You mean? Try well, to get a or jump? you don't touch the wall. You know, or there's a lot. You, or you you breathe before. You know, on backstroke, you look like you're about to turn on your stomach or things like that. There's certain ways they have to go off the block or not. You know, to enter the water, how to do turns. They're legal stroke versus an illegal stroke. I see when so, I'm thinking about swimming and I'm not very familiar with, I just think whoever can get there to there, the fastest right. wins, <laughs> yeah. but there's pretty strict on technique. There is, yeah. and there are different events. So there's different lengths of races for each stroke. And then there's an individual medley, which is all four strokes and um, things like that. So, and, and all these kids were given their U.S. Paralympic classification um, by the U.S., one of the U.S. Paralympic classifiers. So there was a um, a technical classifier who looked at them in the water and then there was a physical therapist that was on the U.S. Paralympic staff that did some manual muscle testing um, to see where they fall yeah. in line with that. Now are there any, um, I know 22 is not necessarily a kid, but I'll say kids younger, are there any of those individuals that are going to the Paralympics in Tokyo? Um, not from Lakeshore. Um, we have a pretty young team. We have ages 9 to 17 i believe but i do feel like either the next games or after that we yeah. definitely could yeah yeah yep. so you're Without are you kind of transitioning to uh, them doing that in the next few years you, like the uh, the exercises that you guys are doing the training are you going to kind of oh right work? now they're being trained yeah. they are so they're, you know yeah. um lakeshore is becoming a usa swimming club as well so that will give them more opportunities to to compete so usa swimming is the governing body of all swimming and so getting in that um world will kind of open us up to some more um, u.s para meets and you know there's a lot of different qualifying standards of times like there's an emerging team standard one of our kids has some of those times and there's a there's a c b and a so now that we've kind of gotten into that world there's kind of a progression if they want to go that way yeah they can see the track there mm -hmm. and, <clears throat> and what that looks like mm -hmm. um on the other end of it kind of the younger six months to mm -hmm. you know six years something like that 
Uh, I've always heard that gymnastics is a really good place to start. So you can kind of see what your limbs can do. You get that balance, but I would mm -hmm. put swimming right into that. Mm -hmm. So if you're a parent or you're a child that's wanting to figure out and have a good understanding of how your body works, mm -hmm. swimming and gymnastics, uh, I think go hand in hand there. Uh, I agree. And a lot of these kids, you know, they may only get a certain number of physical therapy visits a year. So that's where Lakeshore is, is great and that we can really expand on what they're already doing. Um, or, you know, we've had kids that have been released from physical therapy to come. And even with the little ones, we have, um, it's called a neck collar. It's, um, it's just a flotation device that goes around their neck. It sounds kind of strange, but it allows all their limbs to be free. And so they may be in a chair or in a stroller 90% of the time, but then you put them in the water and it's like, oh, I can move. And that's building muscles that then translate to things that they do on land. I have seen something similar to that. Mm -hmm. And I got a little freaked out. It was a baby in one of those. Mm -hmm. And I was like, what are they doing to this baby? <laughs> uh, and they had it in the pool, but the baby was just chilling. They love it. And we've had some of the older kids that use them. They're, we have three different sizes based on weight. And so they've been able to tell me, no, this feels really good. I like it, um, you know. Because one of the th yeah. I'd be worried if I was using one that it wasn't it wasn't going to hold me above water. Anymore. Well, and you know, we would never put someone in there, an infant, unattended. You yeah. know, we would be right there with them, but it would allow us to not be completely hands on. And we've talked about this the last time we had a broadcast. Um, we've I've seen YouTube videos of throwing kids in pools and waiting for them to turn over at like a few we, months old. We don't We're do that here. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, a lot of kids with. Um, genetic syndromes or um, any sort of delay or anything like that, there's just those reflexes might not be there. And yeah. I personally feel like that can also foster some fear that we don't really need. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's great for some, but that's just not something that we do yeah. at Lakeshore. No, I, when I saw those YouTube videos, I was like, I don't, I, don't, I feel like I'm watching child abuse or something like yeah, that, like go back. We do <laughs> talk about water safety too. So mm -hmm. we'll do some of those similar things and talking to the kids about if you get stuck, turn over on your back, you know, get to the wall, things like that. Yeah. And I think that, um, like you said, being able to find out what your body can do mm -hmm. um, and that stability there is really big at a young age. Yep. Uh, and you can build on that through uh, whether that's through swimming, uh, there's a whole track here at, at uh, Lakeshore. Now, um, are there certain times of the year that these youth programs start um, that you have to sign up by? Um, you know, normally like leagues or mm -hmm. that kind of stuff. So they are pretty ongoing. We have, so technically we have like a fall session, a spring winter session and a summer session. The classes are the same. The times might just be a little bit different based on the session and um, school schedules and things like that. So we are finishing up our summer session this week and we will begin, we will resume and start our fall session August 30th, I believe, 30th or 31st, but we're gonna have a parent meeting August 23rd. So that would be open to anyone who, um, members or non-members who wanna hear about Lakeshore, that's where we would do um, registration for those. I think we're going to try to record that and do a virtual component as well for those individuals who can't come or aren't comfortable in a group setting um, just to kind of talk about the snapshot of all that um, and swim team will resume then as well. Now are there openings for that program? There are so all of the classes you know we kind of do a clean slate every session so first come first serve um, we have paired our classes down a little bit um, but as we notice enrollment getting back up and classes filling up, we will either add instructors or we'll add class times. I got gotcha. you. Um, so fall, the 23rd is the parents meeting starts mm -hmm. the 31st, August 31st. Yes. Um, and I'm sure that can be found on the Lakeshore website there. It should be. I don't think it's up there yet, but it should be. And if there are any specific questions, I'll be happy to answer those as well. Okay. And um, as we kind of come to a close here, um, I wanted to ask when people are getting into the pool, besides the national champions uh, <laughs> that you guys have just been crowned, are there any uh, shout outs that you'd like to say you might bump into uh, and kind of f famous Paralympians uh, here that use the pool? Well, we have two swimmers that um, are on staff at Lakeshore. Um, there's Amy, who I believe has gone six to six Paralympic Games, wow. I believe. Is that right? Amy Bruder. Amy Bruder. And then Daniel Camber. They both work at our front desk because um, he went in 2004 to Athens. So um, 
Daniel is in the pool almost every day. Um, Amy is in there a good bit as well. Um, and he's the co-coach. He is the, the coach swim, and swim team. yeah, um, and so they're they're them. around. Uh, I always think that's really cool if you're going to go into uh, doing something, uh, whatever that is, to have somebody around that's been at the top. Mm -hmm. So you can kind of pick their brain and see what they do and just, mm -hmm. you know, watch from a distance almost. Uh, but it, it is a leg up if somebody doesn't have that uh, somewhere else in the country. Yeah, right. And, and you know. it's been great for the kids to be able to say to Daniel, well, what's your classification? Like, you've been right. through this. So, you know, what, and I've learned a lot as well about how that classification process works and... You know, it's neat to have. Yeah, there's 15 grades right. in swimming, as as Bob was talking about, just you know, the 3.5 in wheelchair rugby. Yeah, that, <laughs> so. that was a little bit new to me, and I need to do yeah. a little bit of research mm -hmm. on that to better yeah, understand. it's a lot. It's a lot. There, there's yeah. a lot for swimming, and there's yeah. actually within swimming there's three different numbers you can be given based on the strokes as well. So your breaststroke classification can be different from your freestyle. Okay. Uh, and I'm sure the individuals like that because you said you don't want to be competing against right. somebody uh, right. if you're a 0. 0.5 competing against a 3.5. Right. Uh, right. So it kind of um, makes sure that you're competing against the right people, right. Uh, which builds confidence. Right. Uh, so Absolutely. very cool. Um, well, as we get to a close here, is there, I'd like to ask, is there anything that we haven't talked about that you think an individual or a parent uh, could benefit from hearing? Uh, Mrs. Lujano, let's start with you gosh we've covered such a wide gamut I, I would say on our website uh, lakeshore.org there is a directory listing it lists all of our uh, email addresses and phone numbers so you can if you have a question and there are no um, you know stupid questions or <laughs> you know we're, we're open to anything um, I will say that a lot of times people think about, well, I have a physical disability and, you know, I'm nervous about getting into the water because I uh, don't have good bladder and bowel function and I've never been able to get in the water. I don't want ever uh, a member to come into Lakeshore and that be a barrier. There's always conversations to be had. There's some education that can come of that and, um, you know, Lakeshore is really really wants to establish a health and wellness program for all and to be inclusive for all. So I think that's, that's one thing I would want to end on and, mm -hmm. and say that, you know, call us, email us. Maybe you can't speak of the conversation, but right. email it, you know. Right. Well, we're going to put your emails in the chat, so. Good, good. <laughs> Ms. Mallard, if there's anything. Um, you know, one of my favorite things about Lakeshore is just that if someone comes in and, and wants to be able to do something, we're going to figure out a way to make that happen. Whether that's adapting something in the water, a different piece of equipment on land, you know, we're going to figure out a way that that person can do that to be the most successful. And I think, you know, just especially in the pool, you know, sky's the limit. We're open to everything, you know. We yeah. love when we're stumped too. Right. You know, we love. When, oh, okay. Let's figure. You know, we've even put a child in there who's on a um, a ventilator twenty four hours a day. So there's, you know, oxygen. Yes. Yeah. We've had, we've and, had it all. We've had it all. And yeah. I'm sure the parents initially think that it's not possible. Um, right. You Sometimes know? they do. Yeah. yeah. And so I think just knowing that we're here and we're going to figure out a way to do that. Um, I would, and I don't know if this happens, but uh, some of the doctors from UAB or Children's um, mm -hmm. referring a lot of the young kids over here for pool workouts. We do have a partnership with Children's Hospital mm -hmm. and UAB Spain Rehab. So we, we do communicate a lot with uh, PTs and OTs that are working with um, in the post rehab world. Yeah. Um, you know, the other thing about safety is that every person in aquatics, even myself included, are lifeguards. And that's part of our requirement to be employed in aquatics. So it's not just the guard that's in the stand. Everybody that has their hand on someone or helping and assisting has that safety training, you know, too. Right. So. I feel very comfortable having my family member here. Mm -hmm. She's sometimes I'll come in with her and sometimes she'll just be with the caregiver. But 
when she comes in with a new caregiver, there's always a training period. Mm -hmm. Usually Emily is there with us. Mm -hmm. um, and then after that, I, there's, I always feel like she's safe here, no matter what happens. She slips, there's gonna be somebody there uh, right with her. And the, one of the coolest things that I always like to say with my aunt is, there are times when we do the steps in the pool where we put the aerobic step down, mm -hmm. and because she has a little bit of trouble on her left side lifting her left uh, mm -hmm. foot up. So it's very good for her to, to do that process in the pool. But in order to get those steps down, a lot of times the caregiver uh, will, my aunt will go to the step, uh, the stool place where everybody's sitting and then put those steps down. But at that point, the caregiver is not around for a few mm -hmm. seconds. And there's always somebody there that's sitting with her. And it's just a simple conversation from the caregiver to the individual. Mm -hmm. Hey, would you mind just sitting a little bit closer to Bridget? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Everybody's always so mm -hmm. cool about it, always interacting. And she gets those genuine interactions uh, here, I think a lot more than other places. Mm -hmm. um, so I, that's one thing that I'd like to highlight about Lakeshore is the genuine interactions that my it um, experiences. Mm -hmm. so. It's been coined the Lakeshore effect. Yep. <laughs> yeah. And everybody's trying to decide. It's just that feeling uh, when you walk out the door. You, right. Yeah. What is it? I like it. <laughs> uh, well, at this point, we'll go ahead and uh, end our broadcast. And uh, to take us out, we'll both kind of look at our respective cameras and, and tell everybody we'll see you next time. Bye. Bye. We'll see you next time.